Dayan on the Basin of America, one of the most prestigious uh, and competent, uh, but they did in the United States. So he's going to talk, and by the way, he's an excellent resource. If any of you want to go to law school and want to understand the halachic issues, uh, he is the guy. Uh, he wrote an excellent book on the, the practice of law according to halacha, and he's going to address some of the issues of commercial law and halacha and their interface uh, in the time that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's so good to be here. It's so nice to uh, meet you all. Should I? I tried to say hello to various people before we get it. we're getting started. It's nice to see you. It's a wonderful group. Commercial law is essentially different from... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my fault. Yeah, yeah. Commercial law is essentially different from the rest of halacha. And it's a great source of confusion for yeshiva students who spend their whole life learning, many years learning, and then they go out to the real world and, um, and the economic real world doesn't conduct itself consistent with halacha, and they start asking questions. And um, the purpose of this shear is to sort of provide you with an overview of some of the issues that you're going to encounter when you leave yeshiva and you go out to earn a living, whether it's in law or business or other areas uh, that are essentially of, com of a commercial nature. And I guess the starting point, which is the most important, is why is commercial law different? Why is it that when you go out there to do business, you don't do business kahalacha? But that's the truth. You don't do business kahalacha. You don't do business inconsistent with halacha, but you'll spend your years in yeshiva learning bavakama, and yet you'll never do a kinyan chalipin in a business transaction. Um, you will learn that metaltalim are eno nikne bekesef, that portable goods aren't purchased with money, and yet you will go to the store with your children um, to buy goods, and you know what it sure appears like? It's purchased with money. And so on and so forth. And those of us who would never conduct our, our Achayim or Yoradeya or Evan Ezer life other than meticulously by halacha, we'll spend our life practicing law or doing business where halacha plays a small role. And this is a very important structural question. And the answer, of course, is very important. Chazal perceived commercial law less rigidly governed by halacha than other areas in the following sense. The rabbis had doctrines that made halacha more flexible. The most important is tenai sheba mamon kayim, which is when I make a condition uh, in a business deal, and the condition in the business deal um, is inconsistent with many areas of halacha, so I turn to you and say, we're going to do a business deal, and in our business deal, kesef is kona even though this is not a business deal that technically is a matter of halacha, kesef is kona. If we agree that in our deal, kesef works, money seals the deal, then money seals the deal in our life. And a more general application of this is the general idea in halacha that on matters of commercial law, we frequently follow the law of the land. And the law of the land is itself just a broad general condition, which is when I buy and sell a piece of property to you, even though we learned in Bavakama that you know how you're kona a piece of property? Kasef, Shtar, or Chazaka. Nonetheless, you really, rarely see real estate developers go out building fences after they've purchased a building. They purchase a building according to real estate law, contemporary American real estate law, and halacha recognizes that if you and I agree to do business according to the law of the land, then the law of the land governs how we do our business deal. The Gemara calls this situmta. Situmta is the word in the Gemara for the idea that if you and I agree that this will be a Kenyan, even if this is not a classical 
Kenyan in the Gemara, if you and I agree that this is a Kenyan, then you know what this is? A Kenyan. And if you and I agree that our real estate closing is only closed and done when we follow the provisions of New York State real estate law, and that's when the transaction takes place, then we all recognize that that's when the transaction takes place. And finally, lurking in the background of this is a reality. It's a reality that was already apparent in the era of the Rishonim, which is, I run a store. I sell tomato sauce. I'm picking tomato sauce because it fits well into the example. You know the way tomato sauce is in these glass jars, and they're a little bit slippery. So the American law is as follows. When I pick one of these glass jars off the shelf, and it slips from my hand and slams into the ground and splatters tomato sauce all over the floor of my supermarket, who's responsible? Supermarket. The supermarket is responsible. The supermarket is responsible. I turn around, pretend it didn't happen, walk down the other aisle, and then I go to the storekeeper and I say, some idiot dropped a can of tomato sauce on aisle number three. You should send somebody to clean it up when I'm actually that some idiot. Yet, as a matter of halacha, it's fairly clear that when I grab onto that can of tomato sauce and it slips from my hand, you know what? I pay. Yet, this is very awkward. I could own a supermarket and hang up a sign. You know what the sign says? If you're Jewish and you break the tomato sauce, you pay. And if you're not Jewish and you break the tomato sauce, just alert the janitorial staff and they will clean up. But already the shach notes that you know what that is? Very impractical. Not only is it very impractical, it arouses a certain amount of, of enmity, of hatred. And that people don't like doing commercial deals by two different standards. And thus the minhag arose, already the shach notes, but it's not unique to him, and it's definitely true in America, that we generally do all of our commercial deals according to secular law. Maybe this isn't true in unique deals that we only do among Jews. Like what? A contract with a rabbi. I'm running a shul, we want to hire a rabbi. Mistama, the rabbi is Jewish. Always. Mistama, the rabbi, is Jewish always. And Mistama, the shul, is Jewish always also. So we'll conduct a shul rabbi contract kahalacha. Both Rabbi Breidowitz and I served as shul rabbis, and our contracts were done kahalacha in one form or another. But, um, but there are very few such jobs in America. There are very few such jobs in the real world in America. Most of us take any customers who do what? Pay. Pay. That's right, and most of us want to be served by any serviceman who is nice, does the job, is cheap. That's right, so I don't want to go to only Jewish physicians, and Jewish physicians don't only want to have Jewish patients. That's not the minog in America at all. You'll go to a pediatrician practice when you have children, and you want the best pediatrician, and you don't really care if the pediatrician who's treating your children is Jewish. Which you re sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. There are extremely competent um, non-Jewish physicians out there, and I would never turn away a competent physician in a time of need because they're of the wrong religion. It's just this is so important to understand. So the minog developed in America that we just do business of this type according to secular law, unless it's a rare and unusual situation in which every one of the buyers and every one of the sellers is Jewish. The buy and sell of lulavim. Okay, I got that. The contract for a rabbi, I got that. But, but everything else that we do is done not kehalacha, but al minag, according to the minhag, and the minhag is a mixture of the minhag and the dina de malchuta dina, um, uh, uh, what secular law really requires, and it's particularly so in halacha when we do deals according to contract, which most deals are, which is we write out our terms. And when I write out my terms and I say this deal will be conducted 
according to the law of New York State, and the closing on our house will be conducted by New York State law, even though I'm a from Jew, and you're a from Jew, and I'm selling you a house in Mansi, Ir HaKodesh, as they say, Mansi, the Holy Land, nonetheless, the house closing in Mansi is done according to New York State law, because that's what we agreed. And um, we, on the whole, think that this is a good idea. It makes our commercial life easier and simpler, and it is done consistent with halacha. Halacha doesn't mandate this, but halacha recognizes that, thank you so much, that, um, thank you so much, that there's nothing wrong with a Jew generally conducting all of his commercial life according to halacha. But it's important to be aware of the fact that there are exceptions to this rule. This is not a universal rule. And I want to stop to focus on a few exceptions, because exceptions are the way that you remember what the rule is. One very large exception is when it comes to charging interest. Even though interest is mundanely common in the secular world, and even though our secular society does not view interest charging as morally wrong, nonetheless, the charging of interest in halakha is treated as isura. It's treated as a prohibition in halacha. And of course, every time I borrow money with interest, I've consented to borrow it and you've consented to lend it. And yet, without some other additional arrangement, a Jew may not lend money to a fellow Jew with interest. A Jew may not borrow money from a fellow Jew with interest. And more importantly, you may not charge an interest penalty on a transaction that has been unnecessarily delayed. So I get regular questions from physicians. Rabbi Broid, I changed my practice now and, um, and my billing company says we need to penalize the people who don't pay their bills promptly. Can I charge them a 1% penalty if they don't pay their bill within the first 90 days? That is a pretty serious interest question that has to be addressed with um, a great deal of care. Because even though that is definitely the common commercial practice, and even though nobody in America views it as scandalous or immoral or makes you a bad human being, nonetheless, halacha insists that the charging of interest between two Jews is a religious prohibition that can't be obviated by consent. And it needs a special kind of an arrangement that we broadly call a heteriska. I'm not going to spend too much time on discussing what is a heteriska, but broadly to highlight for you that if you expect to charge people interest in the course of your commercial dealings, you need a special arrangement. Another one are situations uh, found in America, but sadly enough found in other places where People resort to customary violence. I'll share with you a Shiloh. Rabbi Broid, this is a 10-year-old Shiloh, I run a furniture company in China. We import wood from Russia. We truck it to our factory in China. We make furniture in our factory in China, which we sell everywhere in Europe. Okay? This is, this is the world we live in, actually. This is a broad international commerce. We buy wood in Russia. We truck it to our factory in China. We make furniture. We sell our furniture throughout Europe. Rabbi Broid, a convoy of trucks came in from Russia short-weighted, meaning the truck drivers stopped along the way and stole some of the wood. And we're no dummies. We weigh our trucks when they leave Russia. We know how much they weigh empty. We then know how much they weigh full. And when you pull into our factory in China, we weigh them again. You know what they better weigh? Same amount. So I, religious Jew, complained to my Chinese foreman that our trucks came in short-weighted. And my Chinese foreman said, no way. He said, couldn't be. And I said, yes, they came in short-weighted. The Chinese foreman said, I'll look into it. I'll get back to you tomorrow. 
I came in the next day. The Chinese foreman said, you were right. They stopped and stole wood off the trucks, and I arranged for them to be killed so that everybody should learn a lesson not to steal from us. Rabbi Broid, what am I supposed to do now? This is what my Chinese foreman told me. They stole from me. We caught them. I had them killed. When my trucks come in short-weighted next time, Rabbi Broid, what am I supposed to do? Should I complain again? If I complain again, you know what's going to happen? They'll kill some more people until they learn to stop stealing from us. On the other hand, it's pretty clear in halacha that what? We don't kill people for stealing. We might kill people for trying to kill us, but when you cat burgle in my house, you break into my house when I'm not there and you don't threaten me at all and you steal my stuff, I cannot hunt you down and kill you to teach you and your friends a lesson not to steal from me. So this is another very important lesson. We in America live in a fairly lawful society. It's not perfect as we know, as we see maybe it's even gotten less lawful these last few years. But you need to stay away from businesses in which illegality permeates the business. And that you can't be in a business in which people who tread on your toes, your foreman arranges to get killed. Killed. Um, can't do that. That's a very complicated shadow. And in general, doing business in a lawless society is extremely complicated because things get what? Out of hand very quickly. Things get out of hand very quickly in a lawless society like China. Um, and the third thing is you need to stay away from businesses in which the secular law views your activity nefariously um, even if the government doesn't tightly prosecute it. You're going to encounter this. The two examples that are ever present in America that I get regular shilas for are the cannabis business and using illegal immigrants, both of which are what? Illegal. Illegal. Federal crimes. Yet what? E everyone in one form or another does. Cannabis, not everybody does. But you can walk along um, uh, a street in Los Angeles, and you know what you'll see? Green pharmacies is what they call them. That's a, such a cute name if you think about it. And generally, I take the view that even though you're allowed to engage in any legal business, you should stay far away from businesses that tread on thin ice. Thin ice. Don't go into the cannabis business, even though they tell you, you know what? It's a good business. Don't do it. Um, don't go into businesses where the core of your activity is illegal workers. Even though what? Everybody does, it. Everybody does it. It's not quite so uncommon to hire an illegal worker. And when you ask me, well, what about the guy who comes... I live in Atlanta. In Atlanta, there are lots of leaves. And every year, uh, somebody comes to my house, a poor Mexican, and says, can I clean your roof for $40? And you know what I say? I say yes. I view that as a Rachmanus. He's poor and he's looking for work. Do I ask him, are you in the United States legally? I do not. I just hire him to do the work on the idea that what? He might be. He, I'm hopeful that he is. I'm hopeful that he is. But I wouldn't enter into a business <laughs> where my business plan is um, uh, built on illegal immigrants. I wouldn't enter into a cannabis business. Um, and I would stay away from businesses that tread on the thinner ice of secular law, even though all my friends who wear suits and ties sit around at Shabbos morning kiddush and tell me how lucrative a business the cannabis business is. It's not a business for a ben Torah, even though cannabis is what I'll call semi-legal. It's not illegal like other drugs. It's semi-legal. You can be overtly in the cannabis business, um, but nonetheless, it does violate federal law. When I was a shul rabbi and we were building a shul building, I made meticulous care that every single person who worked in the building was 
legal. Legal. I wouldn't let them hire anybody who was illegal. Did I look at the papers of every single worker? No. But I made every contractor and general contractor sign a document saying they examined the, uh, the papers of the workers and the, and the workers were legal because I thought a shul operates lifnim mishurad adin, yeah, above can, the middle. I can interrupt just for a moment. So the sure, problem. please. Um, is, is the issue Chilu Hashem or Dina Damalchus Adina? It's a combination of both. I'm not sure if Dina Damalchus Adina technically applies in situations where the government says this is illegal but doesn't prosecute. Um, and it definitely has a component of Chilu Hashem. And when you press me, like all your children will do, you'll be driving in the car and the speed limit says 55 and you know what you're doing? 60, 65. And your children say, Daddy, Daddy, we are law-abiding Torah Jews. Why are we speeding? So at first, you slow down. You say, oh, I wasn't paying attention. And then 30 seconds later, you know what your children say? Daddy, you're speeding again. Um, and then you stop and explain to your children at the right age and at the right moment that when there's a clear, well-established speed limit that everybody's driving at, the speed limit says 55, but if you're driving 55, you know what? People are passing you and they're honking the horn and you're driving too slow. It's almost dangerous. So I say to my children, when everybody is not obeying the law of this type, um, then maybe you don't have to. But I think that there's a difference between something like speeding and something like cannabis. And I think that there's a difference between an activity which the government has stopped labeling criminal at all and an activity that the government has said, like cannabis, we will not enforce the law. That's a little more complicated. Rabbi Breitowitz and I had an exchange a few days ago yesterday or two days ago, about a similar case that both of us have encountered, which is couples that want to get married kahalacha, but not civilly. Um, and uh, I think that's okay, because the secular government is no longer careful on uh, people living together who are not married. It's not a crime for a man and a woman who are not married to live together. And it's not a chil Hashem anymore. Either, but Avonu Seinu Araba. Maybe I'd be happier living in a society where it, it was a a, a, a chil Hashem, but it's no chil Hashem for secular people to live together. When I got married in my first year of law school, my law school classmates were befuddled. I was twenty when I got engaged, and just twenty-one when I got married, and they couldn't figure it out. They said, "Why do you Why are you getting married? What should you do?" You should live together. Why get married? That seems so permanent and so complicated. You should just live together. And if it works out well, in 15 years you can get married. That sounds so much better. So I kept on saying that, like, I wear a kippah. I'm a religious Jew. I don't do these things. But it was, living together is not a sin, a violation of American law. Cannabis is particularly complicated because... It's a, it's a flat-out violation of federal law, and I think it still has an element of Chil Hashem in it, although, as we all know, Chil Hashem has an element of subjectivity, and what is and what is not a Chil Hashem um, uh, varies from time to time. Even things that are permissible, that secular people frown on overtly and consider it a, a Chil Hashem, uh, a desecration of the public morality, I discourage people from doing. The classical example was in the middle of COVID um, when the government said no public gatherings, even though I was very sure that public gatherings outdoors to burn your chametz had no risk of COVID transmission, I discouraged them in Chutzlarts where I thought it had an element of Chil Hashem for something that's not really a Dvar Mitzvah at all, really between you and me, there's no absolute halachic requirement to burn your chametz. There's certainly no requirement to have an outdoor burning with all of your friends. I said people, if they want to burn their chametz, should burn it in their backyard, and there should be no public burnings of chametz because the non-Jewish newspapers will report what? Gatherings. No, we said no gatherings, and here you're standing outside gathering. Please don't do that. I think that that's a a wise, um, general approach. 
And there are many other examples in the real world of your commercial life where you'll have to stop and ask a shayla. Um, when your business wants to own or deal with chametz on Pesach, you're going to have to ask a very technical shayla. This is very complicated. I, I know many people. They own a law firm. The law firm is in their name. And everybody who's in the law firm is an employee. And they run a refrigerator where employees come in with chametz, their lunch. Um, they put their lunch in the refrigerator. Do you have to take steps to prevent that? I think the answer is no, because in America, the clear practice is when I put a refrigerator in my office and I say this is for employees to put their lunch in, I don't own the chametz. And if I were the owner of the law firm and I came in and I ate your lunch, you would say what? Stealing. You stole it. That's what you would say, you'd, uh, you stole it. But on the other hand, the firm has to be extra careful in those settings that things that belong to the firm, that it gives to the employees, it's very common in a law firm that uh, there's Muffin Monday. When I worked at Davis Polk, Muffin Monday. If you got in Monday before 9 in the morning, they serve muffins to en encourage the attorneys to come in early Muffin Monday. And because there were so many from employees, you know what? All the muffins were kosher. All the muffins were kosher at Davis Polk. They were only kosher muffins because more than 10% of the associates kept kosher. So you have to be very careful when you have muffin Mondays um, that there's no Pesach muffin Mondays. You have to be very careful as the owner to make sure even though you're serving your employees um, that none of them, that you watch out for the Isur, the isur of owning chametz, which is not the Isur of your eating chametz, because you, of course, would not eat chametz. Yes, please. Is the issue there because you're providing the muffins in that case? There's both a lifnei iver to your Jewish employees, but much more importantly, you are the owner of the muffins, and on Pesach there's an independent prohibition to own chametz, even if it's chametz that... You would never eat. You would never eat the chametz, but nonetheless, when I ask who bought the chametz, who paid for the chametz, there's an independent Easter to own uh, chametz on Pesach, even if, in fact, there is no possibility um, that you will eat it. And there are other situations in which uh, halacha rears its head and says, um, you may not follow Dina de Malchus Adina. Um, and when you encounter such situations, it's worthwhile um, to pick up and ask a shayla. And if you move to a place in which you're doing business and there's no real rule of law, where secular law is very catch and catch can, um, China, uh, Mexico, um, you have a whole series of other shaylas as to how you interact with your employees in a situation in which you come much closer to prohibitions like theft. Um, or even, God forbid, retzach, killing. Um, in lawless societies, lawlessness has a tendency um, to be contagious and go very quickly to acts of violence. Nonetheless, um, it's worth understanding that, that for many of us, we don't have a life exclusively in Torah. We learn during our free time, but many, many, many of us enter into real estate or law or medicine we don't exclusively earn our living in Torah, and you know what that is? That's fine. And a ben Torah conducts himself kehalacha all the time, um, but even though you conduct yourself kehalacha all the time, um, not every commercial transaction that you engage in must actually be done according to halacha. There are many situations in which you will conduct business deals and commercial transactions according to secular law. Uh, thank you all very much. I gather there's a Yom Kippur Katan event at 1240. If anybody wants to ask a question, I'll take a question or two. That clock says it's 1235. Yes, please. Um, what about having the entire <coughs> office building clean for Pesach? Is that something that you have to do if the building is in your name? If you own the building, those parts of the building um, that are yours, as opposed to rent it out, 
um, you must make sure are chametz free. Now, you don't have to clean them spot clean so there are no crumbs, but if you own a building and there are parts of the building where there is food that you are the owner of the food of, that food cannot be chametz. But when I rent you an apartment building, I own an apartment building, and I have tenants, I don't have to make sure my tenants don't have chametz. The chametz is theirs, and the space is rented to them. They are the owners. And so if I went into my tenant's apartment and I ate their dinner, my tenants would say, you stole it. You stole it. I think that that's correct. No, so how do you analyze the refrigerator situation? Because the food belongs to the employees. Right. The food but, the but the refrigerator belongs to the... Right. So this is like the poel who comes to my house to fix my furnace who brings lunch. My furnace stops working on Pesach. I immediately pick up the phone and I call the furnace repair guy. He comes and he looks at the furnace and he's going to say, gosh, this is going to take seven hours. I say, get cracking because it's very cold outside. You need to get the furnace to work. He works for four hours. Then he opens his lunchbox and he takes out his sandwich. So I don't scream at him, eat outside, because the sandwich is his. And if I st stepped in and I grabbed his sandwich, what would I say? What would he say? Stealing. He'd say, stealing. I don't own the sandwich even though I own the fridge. I think that that would be different than if I, for example, if I provide lunch to my employees once a week, we all get together Tuesday afternoon, and this is Tuesday of Chol to Pesach, the food has to be kosher for Pesach, or at least not chametz. the sandwich, but if he drops any crumbs and leaves your facility, uh, leaves the facility technically they become like Kafka and they belong to you. Right, so the Mishnah Brewer already notes that crumbs that um, normal people wouldn't eat, I can't lick with my tongue but don't violate Bal Yira, Bal Yimatzai. So assuming my worker doesn't leave a sandwich, if my worker says, you know, I brought in two sandwiches but I only want one, I think I need to say to him, take your sandwich with you, don't leave a sandwich in my house. But when my worker eats his sandwich and a, a crumb drops, the Mishnah Ruhr already notes that there's no bal yira, bal yimatze, on an amount of chametz that we would consider infinitesimal and invisible. You still can't eat it, mm -hmm. but you're not over bal yira, bal yimatze, with the crumbs that my worker leaves. My worker says to me, the worker says to me, I brought two sandwiches, but I only had one. What should I do? I say, you should take your sandwich home for your children. And he says, I want to throw it out. I say, the garbage is outdoors on the way out. Please throw out the garbage. I think so. I think we rely on Rav Moshe that once the garbage is already outside, it's much closer to Hefker. I think that that makes analytic sense. And another question, yes. Another question. Is there any division of liability between business entity and business entity that belongs to a Jew and a Jew himself? Um, this is the question of whether corporations are invisible in halacha or not. There's a dispute among the achronim. Um, uh, there are three basic theories. One theory says corporations are totally invisible, and any corporation that you own is yours. Uh, the second theory is the Minchas Yitzchak's theory of control, which is it depends who controls the corporation. If you own and control the corporation, it's yours. But Einachinami, I can buy 50 shares in McDonald's without any difficulty because when I go into a McDonald's and I say I own 50 shares, they sort of, they don't know what to say. They don't, you don't get any special treatment at McDonald's just because you own 50 shares of McDonald's. And then there's, then there's the view of, of, of Rabbi Chil Yaakov Weinberg and currently the view of the Minchas Asher that um, corporations are separate entities from halacha and if my corporation owns chametz, there's no Easter for me. I find that view the most difficult, but nonetheless, there are Gedoli Postkim who say it. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. You should be blessed to live a life of Torah. Thank you for listening to this awesome Eich production. To find out more and to partner in our mission, please visit ohr.edu.